Light is a form of electromagnetic radiation. At some wavelengths, it appears as visible light. At others, it takes the form of radiation we cannot see, such as ultraviolet, infrared, and x-rays. X-rays have very short wavelengths that, unlike visible light, are able to pass right through most tissues in the human body. Since bones contain calcium, a denser material than most other tissues, they are able to stop some of the x-rays and can thus form a shadow. If you place your hand in front of a flashlight, it will cast a shadow on the wall behind it. In a similar manner, x-rays directed at the body produce shadows on the opposite side that can be registered on film or on a digital sensor, so that bones are clearly visible while soft tissues, such as muscle, are shadowy. As a result, the two-dimensional images formed by the x-rays are quite useful in revealing structures within the body and can easily display fractures in bones. Hello, my name is Alexander Fleming. I'm a doctor, and just under a hundred years ago, I discovered penicillin, quite by accident. This is the story of what happened. If you go to the doctor when you're feeling ill, he or she might give you antibiotics to kill the infection. Well, it was me, Alexander Fleming, who discovered the most famous antibiotic of the lot, penicillin. And today, it saves the lives of millions of people all around the world. Before penicillin, there was no way to cure infections and even a little cut on the knee if it got badly infected, could turn into something serious enough to kill you. So let me tell you a little bit about me, Alexander Fleming. I was born on a farm in Scotland. My father was a farmer and my mum was a farmer's daughter, so it's kind of lucky that I didn't become a farmer too. My older brother Thomas became a doctor when he grew up and I decided that I wanted to follow in his footsteps. So he said, come on Alexander, come to London and study at St Mary's Hospital. It's one of the best hospitals in the country. At St Mary's, I started work in a laboratory, learning everything I could about bacteria and disease, squeezing my syringe of germs into little dishes to see how it grew. My professor, Sir Armroth Wright, was rather strict and scary, but he taught me how to understand germs. And I used to do some really weird experiments. One day, I went to work with a bad cold. Some of my snot accidentally fell into the bacteria dish I was working on. Whoa! That's strange, I thought. My gooey green snot has killed some of the bacteria in the dish. From that, I learned that there is a magic ingredient in our snot, our sweat, and our spit that protects our body from some germs. I call it lysosome. When the First World War broke out in 1914, I went to work in a field hospital on the battlefront, helping soldiers with their horrible wounds and injuries. So many of these poor young men died in hospital rather than on the battlefield from their horribly infected wounds. Their lives could have been saved if only we knew how to fight the infection. Do you know, I'm an untidy kind of person and my lab was always very messy. Old food, manky test tubes, uneaten sandwiches and dirty lab dishes that I never washed up. But you can tell your mum that being messy can sometimes be a good thing. I left my laboratory in a big old mess when I went off on holiday one summer. Oh, it was nice to be on holiday. I took my wife and our two children and we went off to the seaside and we had a lovely time. When I got back to my lab after the holiday, I noticed that one of my dirty dishes had grown a big blob of mould on it. Just like if you didn't wash up your cereal bowl, it would go green after a few days. That's funny, I said. And then I saw it! All around the green mould in the dish, the bacteria were dead. That gunky green mould had killed everything near it. The mould was called penicillin, and it was amazing. It could kill germs. 
I was so excited and I ran off to tell all my fellow scientists what I had discovered. But they weren't impressed. Not at all. They weren't interested and they didn't think it could ever work as a medicine. Boring idea. It'll never work. Ten long years went by without anyone noticing my amazing discovery. Until one brilliant man did. And that man was me, Ernst Chain. I am a scientist and I am from Germany. I was working at Oxford University and one day I was flicking through Dr. Fleming's paper about penicillin when I thought, wow, this is an incredible idea. I must call my brilliant Australian friend, Howard Florey. He's a scientist, like me, here at Oxford, and together we can see if this green mold is any good. So the first thing we had to do was find out if this penicillin stuff did actually kill infection. Our patient was a policeman who had scratched his eye on the thorn bush. His eye had become all gooey and green, and it looked like he might die. And guess what? The penicillin did work! The infected area around his eye disappeared. Our next question was, how can we make lots and lots of penicillin? Penicillin mould needs plenty of air, so we started growing it in big dishes and wide bowls, and even hospital bedpans. Then we filtered the liquid through some parachute silk to get the pure penicillin. But we did it all by ourselves, and we couldn't make enough. We needed to ask some big powerful friends to help us. So we went to America, to the companies that make medicine and explain the problem. They agreed to help us make seriously big quantities and we needed to start with the very best quality penicillin mold. Do you know where we found it? On a rotten old melon, just like these ones. Maybe you've had one. We added the mold from the melons to big containers full of water and a syrup that comes from corn like this and then we waited for the mold to grow. We started producing it in factories and we tested it on white rabbits from New Zealand. And when we knew it was safe, it was put into bottles and boxes in a factory. And soon we had mountains of it. Enough for everyone. Since that time, in 1945, penicillin has become the most often used antibiotic in the world and has saved countless lives. And who do we have to thank? That's right. Let's hear it for Alexander Fleming. I discovered it. Ernst Chain. I knew Dr. Fleming's discovery could work. <laughs> Howard Florey. And I made it into medicine for everyone. Dr. Ronald Ross made a startling discovery. In the mosquito's gut, he found 12 delicate circular cells, which he realized were parasites previously observed in the blood of malaria patients. This discovery confirmed the suspected, but till then unproven link between malaria and mosquitoes, which transmit the disease through their bite. For centuries prior to this discovery, it was believed that malaria was caused by bad air, hence mal aria from the Italian. The first major challenge to this theory came in 1880 when Alphonse Laveron, a French army surgeon stationed in Algeria, noticed parasites in the blood of a patient suffering from malaria. After failing to find the parasite in the air, water and soil, Laveron began to suspect the parasite could be spread by mosquitoes. However, it was Ronald Ross who provided the definitive scientific evidence to support this theory. After two years of meticulous research examining thousands of mosquitoes fed with malarial blood under a microscope, he finally came across the malaria parasites. Born in India where his father was based as a soldier, Ross studied medicine in London before entering the Indian Medical Service. He had seen the devastation caused by malaria firsthand and was determined to study the disease. After his discovery, Ross went on to lead malaria prevention work around the world including initiating programs in West Africa, the Suez Canal Zone, Greece and Mauritius, where he developed a groundbreaking mathematical model to study the distribution and causes of the disease. 
Ross was knighted in 1911, and the Ross Institute and Hospital for Tropical Disease was founded in his honour. The institute was later absorbed by the London School of Tropical Medicine, which continues to work on improving healthcare worldwide. In 1902, Ross became the first Briton to win the Nobel Prize for Medicine. Hannes Gutenberg, today's high-speed commercial printing presses, can produce up to 15,000 sheets an hour. His inventing of metal movable type in 1450 has accurately been called an invention that changed the world. And the first major book he printed was the Bible. It's estimated there were about 30,000 books in all of Europe before Gutenberg's press. Less than 50 years later, there were as many as 12 million books. And the book that was printed was often the Bible. As people became more interested in studying the Bible, Bibles were printed not only in Latin, but in German, French, and even ancient Greek. Many believe that without the Gutenberg Press, the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century might not have been possible. Engage with the Bible. Experience the book that shapes history. Hold the ballpoint pen, but where did it come from? Meet Laszlo Biro, born in Hungary in 1899. As a journalist, Laszlo Biro was fed up with fountain pens. Their ink smeared and took too long to dry. With the help of his brother, Biro designed a pen with a new tip made of a ball and a socket. As the pen moved across the paper, the ball would rotate and pick up a layer of ink. As the ball continued rotation, it moved the ink to the page. The ballpoint pen was a clever idea, Good job. but it didn't gain worldwide attention until British pilots in the Royal Air Force started using the pen during flights. Because ballpoint pens do not rely solely on pressure to distribute ink, they function better than fountain pens in high altitudes. Biro patented the pen in both France and Argentina, and Argentines celebrate Inventor's Day on the anniversary of Biro's birth. In many countries, ballpoint pens are called bureaus in his memory. First, let's take a look at why the mechanism is so hard to make. When writing with a ballpoint pen, the ball turns and the ink rolls out. It's kept in place by a socket separating the ink reservoir and the paper. The ball needs to move freely, which means the room between the ball and the socket needs to be perfect. Too tight and the pen will be difficult too loose and the ink leaks or the ball falls out. The ball is normally made from high-grade stainless steel that's resistant to wear caused by continuous writing on surfaces.
Expert Maglev comes from the combination of magnet and levitation. Maglev trains take advantage of a physics principle that says two like magnetic poles will repel each other. For instance, the north pole of one magnet and the north pole of another magnet pointed at each other will push away from each other. But if we put a south magnetic pole and a north one together, they will attract. Maglev trains take advantage of both of these ideas, not only to provide levitation, but also propulsion. In order for the train to levitate, the two like poles are forced to repel each other like the magnets shown here. To provide propulsion, the train is outfitted with a north and south pole magnets along the sides. The track also has north and south pole magnets whose poles can be switched quickly. As the poles are switched, the train is attracted to and then repelled by the same magnet. The faster the pole switch, the faster the train goes. Now you may be asking yourself, why is all this necessary? We already have trains. Maglev trains offer one key advantage over typical rail and high-speed rail, and that is minimal resistance. Unlike other trains that must stay connected to the rail, maglev trains can float above the rail, only having to overcome air resistance. The only problem with maglev trains are that they are very expensive, costing between $50 and $200 million per mile. Compare that with a reported $82 million for high-speed rail and a meager $2.5 million for typical rail service. Maglev trains still may have a home if the Hyperloop ever takes off. Nas Secuto showed me something extraordinary that happens when a really cold superconductor meets an ordinary magnet. Oh, oh. And there is the levitation, you know? And this little puck is just the tip of the iceberg. Oh, come on! <laughs> Let's do it. To the I'm actually surfing above the ground. I'm flying! And it's more than just fun and games. Engineers in Japan are already scaling it up to create the world's first superconductor maglev passenger train. It flies above its tracks at speeds up to 311 miles per hour. And it's cold that makes it happen. So, what's the trick? You might think that the superconductor is acting just like a magnet. This is now a magnet? But you'd be wrong. It's not like a magnet, because here you have both repulsion and attraction. So these two discs have repulsion and attraction? Both. And that's not how a proper magnet behaves. It can't do both at the same time. The superconductor can, because it warps the magnetic field of the magnet to a point where it attracts and repels at the same time. It's both directions. It's, it's, it's a watch. But how is this possible? How do superconductors actually work? Looking through all of history, it would seem that the mobile phone has caused the most rapid changes in daily life ever seen. Phones have altered our expectations of what's possible and even our mental process. Now we expect to have all things with us at all times in our pocket. The entire world is at our fingertips, instantly. We even tend to perceive time in such a way where a few seconds is an eternity. If a phone takes more than a few seconds to boot up and snap the perfect shot, that's just not good enough. We are able to read, watch, listen to, consume, and sometimes even create from anywhere at any time. What I've just described is the smartphone revolution, and it's only a decade old. Before the smartphone, in the 2000s and 90s, phones were a lot less than this. They just made phone calls, had a basic organizer, and in latter years, a modest camera and very basic internet if you were lucky. But go back into the 1980s and mobile phones just did one thing, make phone calls. But the question is, what was the first one of these primitive phones that just made phone calls? What was the original phone that would become the grandfather to all the billions of phones in our pockets? Where did it come from, who invented it, and what's the story behind it? In this video, we'll take a look. To start the story of the first mobile phone, we have to go back to the 1960s. Technically at this time, mobile phones did exist, but only in cars. And if you had one, you were the boss of the town, a real high flyer. As it turns out, since the 1940s, car phones had enjoyed limited use in large cities of the United States. Putting a phone in a vehicle was the only way to make them mobile. This is because the phones took so much power to run that only car batteries could supply it. Another drawback was that for a given area, only 12 channels existed, so most of the time you would have to wait to use a network. Just to connect to a call could take 30 minutes. That's just the way it was and the way it always will be. 
until 1968 that is. In this year, the Federal Communications Commission asked AT&T to fix this issue. AT&T then came up with a cellular architecture. Its aim was to break up the large areas of coverage into smaller ones so that multiple people could use their phones in their cars at the same time. Regular mobile systems use a central high power transmitter to serve an entire city. But this way, only one telephone call can be handled on a radio voice path at one time. AMPS makes many more radio channels available at one time to many more customers by using a number of low power transmitters. Each transmitter is the heart of its own separate area or cell. As a vehicle drives from one cell to another, advanced electronic equipment at a central location called a mobile telephone switching office automatically transfers the call by telephone line to another cell without the caller knowing it. If I didn't have uh, my phone, it would be a disaster. Uh, I don't know what I'd do, really. I'd be back to uh, coming off the tollways looking for a phone, customers yelling, screaming, where are you, why haven't you called, why don't you care. Around the same time, Motorola had a car phone division and didn't want AT&T to have a monopoly on products that could take advantage of this new system. Motorola feared that this would be the end of their mobile business if they didn't do anything. So they decided to develop a phone to utilize this new cell technology and asked a man by the name of Martin Cooper to spearhead the project. In 1972, he got started. The thing was, there was a lot of risk here because at the time, Motorola didn't really have the capital to absorb any failures. If they spent a whole bunch of money on this project and it failed, it could spell the end for Motorola. AT&T on the other hand were giants. They could throw as much money as they wanted without worrying. It was David versus Goliath. But to a desk, a home, a building, a car or even a place at all. Why not assign it to a person? You could be connected wherever you are to whoever you wanted. This was a revolutionary idea. With this thought, Cooper defied the industry's narrow vision of car phones and went for the idea of a personal, portable form of communication. Now that he had the vision, all he had to do was set his team up to build it. But could this even be done? Nobody knew. Martin was banking on a brand new technology that could make this vision a reality, the microprocessor. It was a tiny chip that could do the same thing as many car phone components with much less space and much less power consumption. Surprisingly, by March of 73, Cooper and his team had a working prototype. On April 3rd, 1973, Martin introduced the Dynatac phone at a press conference in New York City. To make sure that his phone actually worked before the press conference, he decided to place the very first public cell phone call. He decided to call an engineer called Joel Engel. He was the head of AT&T's rival project. So Martin simply called Joel just to tell them that he'd beaten them to the mobile phone. In that first call, we didn't know it was going to be historic in any way at all. We were only worried about one thing. Is the phone going to work when we turn it on? Fortunately, it did. In 1983, after years of development, Motorola introduced the first portable cell phone to consumers. It was the Dynatac 8000X. It almost weighed one kilogram and was absolutely huge because it needed so much battery to power it. Despite all of that battery, a full charge took roughly 10 hours and it offered only 30 minutes of talk time. And to top it all off, its price was almost $10,000 adjusted for inflation. So when you hear all of that, you're probably thinking that this mobile phone product was a failure. Well actually, far from it. As it turns out, the value of talking anywhere at any time made the cost worth it. And the phone eventually became a success, kicking off the mobile phone revolution. When Martin made the first mobile phone call back in 1973, there was only one real cell phone. Now, there are more mobile phones than people. So what's Martin up to today? At age 88, he sits on committees supporting the Federal Communications Commission and the United States Department of Commerce. So that's the story of who invented the very first mobile phone. I say good on Martin for taking the risk and thinking outside the box. He literally changed the world and all of our lives.